Good afternoon, everyone. I've got the fantastic privilege of talking to you about uh, this afternoon about regulatory trends in AI. And it's an exciting topic because it really is the kind of the new frontier in technology law and policy. This is an image on the screen now created by a generative AI art model. We asked it to produce an image showing the landscape of future artificial intelligence regulation. And this, this is what it came up with. <laughs> and it did something that good machine learning algorithms are supposed to do, which is be surprising and useful, helpful, and actually depict a city under construction. If you look carefully, you can see the cranes and so on dotted about. And that kind of fits, because what I'm going to talk about are laws and other regulatory measures that in the main aren't here yet, but are being built as we speak, They're kind of rapidly taking shape. But before we look at the regulatory landscape, I think it's helpful at the outset just to take take a step back and consider the fundamental question of why regulate AI at all, which is to say, what is it about AI, as distinct from other forms of technology and software, that means that we might need laws or other forms of regulatory intervention devoted to it? So hopefully many of you will be familiar with some of the concepts on this slide. Uh, these are the uh, the generally recognized uh, ethical and, and legal challenges associated with AI. And I'll just go through them quickly. So autonomy, right? It's, it's the ability of machine learning algorithmic models to make their own decisions when undertaking tasks to a level that match or exceed human level capability, at least in very specific domains, that's at the heart of all of this. If we're going to delegate important decisions to machines, if we're going to have machines making their own decisions out there in the world and doing stuff, we need to be as sure as we can that those outcomes are safe and ethical. Opacity. So opacity is that complex machine learning algorithms are so technically sophisticated that it can be impossible to understand how they've produced particular outputs, the so-called black box effect. This is a problem, generally speaking, for transparency purposes, if you want to explain to somebody how the algorithm works. But it's uh, specifically an issue if the algorithm causes some kind of harm or damage, and you need to reverse engineer and understand how it was that that problem problematic output occurred. Bias. In terms of bias, as I expect many of you know, Machine learning models are trained on large data sets, and the data sets will invariably contain various biases because the world is biased, and the model uh, may repeat or even amplify those biases and generate outputs that, is, that are discriminatory or toxic or biased towards various marginal groups. And on privacy, uh, in particular, the ability of machine learning algorithms <coughs> to uh, infer or generate highly accurate and insightful personal information about someone from the other data about them that it is exposed to presents a new kind of challenge for privacy law. So given all of that, what kind of measures have been taken and are being taken to mitigate or control these kinds of risks? So, I'm going to go through these now, starting at the, the sort of softer end of the spectrum, if you like. So AI ethics principles are statements of the ethical principles that are supposed to apply when creating new AI technology. They're fairly ubiquitous. Lots of organizations have them. The OECDs are generally considered the most important and influential. A huge amount of work has gone into these. And I don't mean to uh, undermine that work. But unfortunately, the reality is, from a legal point of view, they unfortunately don't carry much weight, at least in isolation. They don't measure or assess compliance. They're not enforceable. Worse, they could even mask 
in action. What is useful, I think, is that the majority of them boil down to the same core principles that seek to address the issues we looked at a moment, we looked at a moment ago. So safety, responsibility, transparency, fairness, and privacy. So I think it's fair to say that there is consensus about the positive outcomes that we want from AI, what good AI looks like. The challenge is how to achieve that. And in fact, there is a huge amount of work, particularly within the major technology companies, to develop tools to solve the ethical challenges of AI at a technical and operational level. And much of this work is dedicated to transparency and explainability, not just of the models themselves, but also the data sets. And also implementing tools that, that detect, reduce, mitigate bias. But it's still a very new field. And I don't think that anyone is arguing that there is an equation or some kind of quantitative methodology that's going to solve fairness, for example. And designing tools like these involves trade-offs and difficult qualitative value judgments to try to find an acceptable outcome. But it seems to me inevitable that tools like these will end up being part of the regulatory landscape for AI in the future. And then there is a huge volume of guidance, frameworks, and other resources published by regulators. Generally speaking, these, are, these kinds of documents aren't legally binding. And what I've listed on the slide are some of the more detailed ones that have been issued that I'm aware of. The ICO's guidance on explainability is a great example of very detailed and practical guidance with separate sections for compliance teams and engineers and senior management. Singapore's AI Verify tool includes technical testing software very similar to that that was listed on the preceding slide. And the MHRA's work on AI as a medical device is a good example of a regulator working on a specific issue within a narrow domain. Then, there are technical standards for AI. So these are standards developed and approved by a recognized standardization development organization, or SDO, like ISO IEC, which many of you will have heard of. The most important European SDOs are Etsy and Sen Senelec. There is a lot of activity right now developing standards for AI within all of these SDOs including ones that tackle non-technical topics like bias and transparency. But we aren't anywhere near yet having a set of generally accepted standards or indeed consensus around which SDO standards to use. However, I think it's fair to say that there is a lot of excitement about the promise that technical standards hold which is to use them as a way of, if you like, cutting through the complexity of regulating AI and ending up in a place where you can point to compliance with a technical standard as a way of satisfying legal requirements. And under EU law, this is achieved via the concept of harmonized standards. And finally, some actual law. The key thing about this list that I want to emphasize at this stage is that, that, is that as we speak, only two of these are actually law. One is the GDPR's provisions on automated processing. The other is China's law on algorithmic recommendations. And by the way, I'm not saying this is an exhaustive list, but these are certainly the kind of uh, more, more mentioned ones that, I, that I'm aware of. But all, so all the rest, other than the top two, are still in different stages of the legislative, legislative process. They're still in the pipeline. So, how to start to think about trends. So if we try to map all the different approaches that I've just been to um, over the preceding slides onto a graph, right, with hard law at the top, soft law, soft guidance measures on the bottom, sector, domain-specific measures on the left, and horizontal, kind of generally applicable measures on the right, you know, what does, kind of, what does that look like? Well, right now, I think the current state is sort of something like this. Lots of horizontal ethics and regulatory measures on the bottom right. 
So operational tools spe specific to particular companies um, over on the left, some standards and a lot of regulatory activity that is domain specific and on the left quadrant there, but not much law. The, the top fields are fairly empty, but where are we headed? Well, I think the future state um, is shaping up something like this. Lots of law coming down the pipeline. And lots happening in the standard space. And an even higher volume of guidance and soft regulatory measures and toolkits in specific sectors over on the left there. And of the laws that are in gestation right now, by far the most significant one is the European Union's AI Act. And I want to spend a bit of time just pausing and discussing that now. So it's the first EU law specifically devoted to AI. It's very ambitious, and it's going to have a lot of influence globally. For AI systems in scope, it will impose a regulatory framework similar to what happens in the product safety world, but tailored to AI products and services. Like the GDPR, it has extraterritorial scope. So AI developers selling AI software into the EU from the US or the UK, for example, will be caught by it. It also has a GDPR style, kind of punishingly high penalty and enforcement regime. So fines of 30 million euros, 6% of global turnover, whichever is higher, for some of the most serious breaches. And partly because it's so ambitious, and partly because of uh, the, um, the institutional uh, process within, within Brussels, it's taking a very long time to move through the legislative process in Brussels. And very long story short, it probably won't apply as law until 2025 uh, at the earliest. So how does it work? The Act regulates AI that causes harm, either because it poses a potential risk of death or injury, or because it, it could threaten fundamental rights and freedoms. It does three main things. Firstly, it completely bans a small number of relatively niche use cases of AI. Secondly, it classifies a closed list of specific other use cases of AI as high risk. And for the high risk use cases, the Act imposes a regime of mandatory technical and transparency requirements and subjects them to a product safety style conformity assessment regime with quality management systems, CE marking, notified bodies, and post market surveillance. Thirdly, the Act has a kind of micro transparency regime that applies to any use of AI that could mimic or, 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 or deceptively uh, deceive somebody that it's a human being. And to AI with those characteristics, it's, it's, it's got a set of uh, dedicated transparency uh, provisions. And those apply to any AI with those characteristics, not just high-risk AI. In practice, almost all of the Act applies um, to high risk, relates to high risk AI. So the key question to ask of, of any uh, AI product or service is whether it's going to be classified as high risk or not. And the Act has two methods for classifying AI as, as high risk. First, where the AI is used in a product that is already covered by the EU's updated product safety framework um, and is subject to a third-party conformity assessment, um, it will be deemed high risk. The Act also has a closed list of other use cases, all of which are deemed high risk. Most of these are quite niche and orientated either to utility infrastructure, law enforcement, or the public sector. For example, immigration control and assessment of eligibility for welfare benefits. And at the heart of the AI Act, is a set of technical requirements that developers of high-risk AI will have to comply with the essential requirements, as they're referred to in the product safety uh, framework legislation, that, if you like, 
high-risk AI systems are going to have to be built too. So for many software developers building AI products and services who will never have, have had to comply with anything like a product safety regime before, the AI Act is going to mean an absolutely profound shift in the way they develop, market, and operate their software. Meanwhile, on the other side of the English Channel, the UK government is taking a very different approach. In fact, its proposals that were published over the summer read almost as if someone in Whitehall had looked at the EU's AI Act and decided to take the diametrically opposite approach <laughs> in every conceivable respect. Right. That didn't happen, right? Um, so instead of a single blockbuster law with a new regulator, um, existing UK regulators will be looking after AI in their respective domains. It's expressly pro-innovation, so only tangible actual risks will lead to regulatory action um, in order to avoid inadvertently uh, uh, dampening innovation through unnecessary law. There will be a set of principles, not techno technical requirements at the heart of the framework um, to try and ensure a coherent approach. And the government will start from the position of encouraging regulators to take a light touch approach. <coughs> so it's pretty clear that the UK government, at least to me, sees an opportunity in AI policy and legislation to exploit a Brexit dividend um, uh, and create a more innovation-friendly environment in the UK as opposed to the EU for AI development. And I think there is a lot to be said for this more pragmatic and flexible approach, particularly given the very different types and level of risk that AI presents in different sectors. But what the UK government hasn't yet explained is the awkward fact that many UK developers will have to comply with the EU's AI Act anyway which could mean overlapping requirements for anyone in the UK developing high-risk AI as defined under the EU's AI Act. In terms of other laws, interestingly, the White House's recently proposed AI Bill of Rights has some sim similarities to the UK's approach in that it proposes a central set of principles but devolves responsibility <coughs> to sector regulators. The conversely, the Canadian AI and Data Act is clearly inspired by the EU's legislation. So it regulates high impact AI, though it leaves the criteria of how to determine high impact to regulations that haven't been published yet. And as a general comment, it isn't as uh, comprehensive as the EU's text. The US Algorithmic Accountability Act and New York's AEDT law both focus on decisions made by automated systems that significantly affect individuals. In that sense, they're inspired by the GDPR's provisions on automated decision making. So I think if there is one, the macro trend in AI law right now is for law that either focuses on decisions significantly affecting individuals made by automated systems, or that regulates AI that the legislation classifies as high risk in one way or another, and I think it will be um, really interesting to see whether a sector-specific approach becomes a norm or we see more uh, horizontal legislation like the EU's AI Act. So in terms of practical recommendations, I think I'd emphasize the following. Whether a particular AI product or service is going to be classified as high risk or not under the AI Act is going to become a very consequential and ultimately resource intensive uh, distinction. If a developer is building software within a regulated product safety, safety environment, then it won't be a huge leap. But for developers who aren't used to operating in that environment, it's going to be a major change and everyone affected needs to start planning well in advance. So my suggestion would be is that if you think you might be affected, then keep a track on the progress of the AI Act. Um, and given its current pace, I'd expect the text to be kind of coming into some sort of final form probably by the end of um, the summer, early autumn next year. 
uh, all products and services that make impactful decisions about individuals are likely to be regulated in the end one way or another. And if you're in a sector that's heavily regulated already, then I think it's fair to assume that you'll have a layer of AI-specific laws or mandatory guidance within, say, three to five years from now, sitting on top of everything else you have to already comply with. And even if you're not affected by any of, the, any of those, I think the reality is, is that best practices in AI and uh, AI development and deployment will be in much sharper focus by the end, by the second half of this decade, particularly once we have technical standards that enable compliance with the AI Act. Um, so uh, I think everyone's going, so I think we're going to come to a world where um, best practice is uh, expected, it's going to be easier to enforce contractually. The good news is, is there, there is a lot of resources out there, uh, even now, to help you understand what uh, best practice looks like in the context of the development and deployment of algorithm models. Thank you very much. All right, so now that you know where the future of AI and regulation is heading, I'm going to turn our attention back towards what we see all organizations in every sector thinking about when it comes to getting more value out of their data through AI and other ways as well. So what I'm going to do next sort of 15 minutes, depending on whether Mark prods me earlier than that, is talk through a few examples of commercializing data that we see in the marketplace, uh, talk about a few of the sort of investments and partnerships that we see various types of organizations need to put in place to get to that point where they've unlocked that value, um, and then talk about a few of the risks and issues that occur along the way. So my first example, this is, here's my wind farm on your left, as you can sort of see it, those three turbines spinning away. My neighbor's wind farm on the right-hand side has been collecting data around how its turbines operate for some time now. They've been really turning that data into action. I only really know when my turbines break once they've already broken, but because my neighbor's been training an AI system with real-world performance data on why and when their turbines break, you know, whether that's the age they're in, the condition, what season, or the environmental conditions that applied, um, they can predict the next best action they need to take in order to correct it. That could be preventative maintenance to stop them breaking in the first place, or recruiting more engineers at a certain time of the year. Whereas my turbines sit idle for a little bit longer than that. And even if I had collected the data around how my turbines had been operating, if I hadn't been applying some sort of machine learning or analytical process to that data to get some insight from it, I'm probably still behind my neighbor. Uh, maybe I can buy a tool from an AI vendor to try and catch up. But realistically, if I haven't been collecting the data for that long, my AI tool is not going to give me any more insight than my neighbor. So my turbines are probably going to be down for longer. So this example is really about turning data into action. And it's really about saying, if you can collect reliable, comprehensive data about any real business activity, there's an opportunity to do things better to turn it into that action. And we see this in the lists of various industry-leading companies across all sorts of verticals, whether that's healthcare or financial services or wind farms. The, the leaders tend to be the ones who are more data-driven, who are doing more things with data, even if they wouldn't describe themselves as a tech or data-led business. So my second example, it's all about using data to build new tech products and services. So say you're a manufacturer of medical devices. The first time you meet your end customer might be here when a clinician is implanting the device you made, say a pacemaker, uh, into a patient. Uh, and that might be it once it's fitted and maybe the patient's had a couple of checkups, your relationship with that end user might, might have ended. Um, but what if you created a connected pacemaker where you've captured the data it generates, use that to develop an accompanying mobile app, and then all of a sudden the patient and their doctor can act, 
ac access accurate, real-time information about the condition of that patient through the app. So suddenly, instead of having to rely on a bedside monitor or physical checkups in a GP surgery, your, uh, your patient experiences a cardiac event on the go, and they can get real-time information to get help faster. And the evidence out there suggests this kind of thing really does save lives. And, and here, this is just an example of a traditional manufacturer pursuing a digital and data-driven strategy. They haven't fundamentally changed their business model. They still make medical devices. It's just that a lot of those devices are software and AI powered by data that they're only just now understanding the value and importance of. All right, my final example, bear with me with this one. It's all about using data to solve bigger, broader challenges out there in the world or in a particular industry. So imagine you run an energy company there on the left-hand side and say there are new regulations coming down the pipe that are going to require you to track the carbon emissions that you emit uh, out in the world and all across your operations. So you can probably quite easily capture your, your, the direct emissions you put out there, but you also need, under the regs, to track emissions across all of your industry partners and through your supply chain. Now, that data is much harder to get hold of in a marketplace like the energy sector, um, and much harder to make sense of as, and report against to comply with those new regs. So you could develop your own, your own tracking tool or pay a third-party data platform company to, to build you one. Um, it's a cost of doing business and probably one that's necessary and you've just got to sort of suck up. Um, but you know at the same time that the whole energy sector, including your competitors, have got to comply with those same regs. But you know there's not currently a good single source of data out on the market to help them comply. So what if you partnered with that big data platform firm to create a solution for the whole sector? And we're seeing this more and more in different domains. The data firm brings its base platform that it's invested in heavily and it's rolled out in other industries and use cases. You bring your data, know-how, and sector expertise. And together, you build and configure a solution exactly how the market and the regulators need it to work. You could even make it available across the whole industry. So you've got other energy companies all across the world contributing data. And if everyone contributed their own emissions data to a single platform, that system could aggregate it and actually produce a meaningful data set that all the players in the ecosystem could use to comply with the regs in their reporting. And, and what about the money? So you could invest in this thing yourself and charge everyone else a subscription fee to use it. It's a common model. Uh, and suddenly you've turned what could have been a pure cost of compliance into a revenue generating opportunity. You could try and gather together all your competitors and industry partners and form a consortium and go together and split the cost and the risk. Um, but either way, you've turned what could have been a pure cost into something where you're actually meeting the challenge in a meaningful way and getting towards net zero in an industry. And this is just an example of a data sharing collaboration across an entire sector where everyone contributes a little bit of data and gets, and in return they start to see a bigger picture can solve a common challenge. Um, it's probably more common historically in some industries like healthcare and life sciences, if you think about research projects, but we're finding it a lot more common in industries where historically and traditionally the players haven't always collaborated so, so much. So those are my three examples. So for any organization to reach that point where they are getting more value out of their data, here I am clicking the slide, it's not moving. There we go. There we go. No, thank you. That might be me. Um, so as I say, for any organization to reach that stage, like in those examples where they've actually unlocked some real value in their data, we find they've usually had to invest in a series of systems or partnerships to deliver on whatever strategy they had in mind. Um, that will involve lots of parts of the organization, including lawyers. So first of all, with systems, we see a lot of clients and organizations investing in systems that help them capture generate, store, and analyze data. So capturing data, that could be back to the wind turbines, attaching sensors to those to actually pull out data and develop systems to ingest it. You, it could be um, a retailer implementing a customer relationship management system, or a bank 
implementing an ERP system to draw data from all the disparate parts, disparate parts of the organization together to see it in one, one place, one single view. Generating more data where it's not already been captured. Back to the medical devices example, there was a situation where real world health data was not, real time health data was not being recorded until the device was connected and an app was built around it. Similarly, it could be a buildings management firm installing Internet of Things devices on its buildings to track energy usage or CCTV to, to track occupancy rates in, in the buildings. Cloud storage, all of that data that's now been captured and generated usually can't really store it on premises, so lots of cloud migration projects, not just to the big hyperscale cloud vendors, but lots of industry specific, specific specialists, specialists who've configured a cloud environment that works exactly how that industry needs it to. It could be a clinical research platform or a facility for secure banking data. Secondly, partnerships, lots of, lots of investments here uh, with third party tech and data firms, often central to doing more with data. So AI, back to the wind farm example, I probably don't have the machine learning engineering expertise in-house. I'm probably buying in a third party solution training it with my data, maybe even getting access to that AI vendor's generalized models that have been trained on lots of other wind farm turbines breaking and getting that next best action. Data sharing collaborations, again, back to medical devices, there's lots of frameworks out there, for example, where companies, medical device manufacturers, pharma companies can access public health data subject to certain rules and restrictions, but to do research and development in a safe and secure way. Technology development projects where we spend a lot of our time. If the strategy is to use the data to build a new technology product, most businesses would need to commission that out, work with third party software and systems vendors to bring them to market. And like in the energy example, they might even want to collaborate further and take that product to the market together to realize that opportunity. And finally on strategy, all I'll talk about here is the commercial model how are you going to actually generate some value through that opportunity with data? And what form does that value even take? It could be money. Uh, and if it is, that's often a challenge we find for traditional businesses in certain sectors who are not experienced with monetizing technology. And data, they can find themselves giving it away for free as a value add on top of their traditional products and services. And the value doesn't need to be revenue. As we know, you know, data can be used for the public good. There are really interesting conversations out there around the value that's sort of locked up in health data or, for example, our transport networks and systems. Um, and they raise some quite hard questions around valuation. It, you know, it's a different value in someone's hands compared to someone else um, and some social and ethical considerations too. And speaking about value, I'll just finish off by talking about some factors and some risks and issues that could actually reduce the value of your data as you pursue a project or a strategy. So taking it from the left, commercial sensitivity in sharing data with third parties is a big issue for our clients. Let's take an AI partnership. The, the, the way lots of machine learning systems work, as Charlie articulated, is by training them on real world data. Um, the more and better the data, the more accurate the outputs for everyone. Sounds like a win-win. Well, understandably, you know, large organizations are often the gatekeepers of that real world data, and fair enough, they're often concerned about that. They want to keep their data secure and control who has access to it. Now, AI vendors will often explain how they aggregate and anonymize their customers' data so that when it's used to train the AI tools, um, that it's not in a form that could disclose sensitive business information or identify a particular customer. And often that sounds kind of reasonable, but query whether it always works in practice. If you're a big industry player and you're working with an AI vendor that hasn't got many customers yet, query how much they can anonymize and aggregate your data so that you're not actually identified if you're one of the few companies out there contributing data. As I heard one founder of an AI company put it recently, Getting the first few cu customers of their business to contribute data is like pushing boulder up a hill. But as soon as that AI becomes usable for that use case in that market and established, 
getting the next few customers to contribute data is like pushing that boulder down the hill. The, the, the rest of that industry feels like they need to be a part of this thing if they're going to do things a little bit better. Moving on, preserving value in data. So this is really important. So often your data is only going to be valuable if you can legally protect it. But often the proprietary rights around data can be a little bit murky. Uh, for personal data, you might possess or control it. But ultimately, it's the individual, the data subject who it's about that owns it. Uh, and there's going to be limits on what you can do with it. Even with um, really important or sensitive business data, what's the protection? We're talking about a mixture of things. You know, IP rights like copyright and database, trade secrets and confidentiality. But there are risks around losing those protections depending on how you share it and how you use it. So is it going to stay confidential if you've exploited it with third parties quite freely? A trade secret probably isn't going to stay like that if you don't take measures to keep it secret. So there are strategies to attain those sort of legal protections, like the contractual restrictions around which you make it available. But as you can see, you know, preserving the legal protections that exist in, in data and that whole myriad of rights around it is an important factor in preserving its value. New, new regulatory risks. So if you're doing new things with data, you can end up quickly being find yourself operating in a regular, in a different regulated sector than you may have considered. Or it might be the way that existing regulations or the way you understand them apply to you differently. So think about that medical device manufacturer example again. They might be very used to understanding how they certify their products, working with notified bodies and taking them to market. Do they understand how the software and AI that they create is governed by, at the moment at least, those same medical device rules? Do they have the ability to comply with those? Say with GDPR, like an insurance company might launch an AI claims management tool, but if that tool is making decisions in and of itself about whose claims get paid out without a human in the loop, is that breaching restrictions around automated decision making in GDPR? AI, as Charlie described, a lot of the compliance is rooted in the product development stage. So, it could, so when those rules come out in, in the next year or two, the AI that's already on the market, it may be too late for those products to have complied. It's very hard to retrofit that kind of compliance. Um, finally, liability risks. So offering new data-driven products and services can open you up to different types of liabilities than the ones you know, the business is sort of used to dealing with. If your new data product is attracting new customers who come to rely on it, they'll, they'll be seeking kind of contractual assurances from you that it's going to meet their needs and their envisaged use cases. Can you give those assurances? It's not always clear. You know, a lot of factors are going to be relevant there. Like, what, who were the sources of the data? Have you got the commitments from them? Is it something where you is there enough of a sample size in that data that can actually truly be reliable? You've got to remember here, a lot of these data services are bundled up with cloud services where a lot of the business model is, because it's so scalable, is quite low cost per unit or low cost per customer. So taking on too much risk on any one contract with any one customer may not really meet the risk reward sort of balance. So I'll sort of finish there and I'll just sort of recap just to sort of say that we're seeing lots of organizations in lots of different sectors doing really interesting things with data, trying to become better businesses, trying to serve their stakeholders better. Yes, there are risks and challenges in the projects and the launch of these things. And as those businesses evolve and change through data, but if they're done sensibly, then getting value out of that data that, that they hold can be really transformative for businesses across all sectors and organizations.